It seems that I'm recording. Yeah. Hello. Okay, great. I'm also recording. <laughs> yes, hello. So nice to see you both. It's so surreal because I always watch the YouTube videos and now yeah. I'm in the interview. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm happy that you're watching the videos. And uh, thank you for yeah. translating our book to Mongolian. That's uh, <laughs> unexpected and, and welcome. Thank you. Yes. Well, um, this is the first time I'm interviewing um, the author of the books I translated. So I, I'll try to do my best, but I'm a little nervous, to be honest. <laughs> then don't, don't, don't the consider this. Time... Don't consider this an interview. Consider it a talk. Okay. We're talking. We're discussing okay. things. Right. So I'd like to introduce both of you to, to the people who will listen to this uh, talk. Uh, so Professor Sam Vaknin um, is the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited uh, book. And Lydia, um, I, I need to pronounce your last Lydia name. <laughs> Lydia Rangelowska is the um, uh, publisher and editor of also Narcissism Revisited, Malignant Self-Love Nar Narcissism Re Revisited book. Okay, I have a surprise. I've just received a copy, oh. Mongolian copy. <laughs> That's so beautiful. Wow. Yes. Oh, I just it received it. Beautiful. Wow. This is volume one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So I, I think see Mongolian we use um, Cyrillic same as um, Russia and some other countries mm -hmm. and we have our traditional letters we but we don't use it yet as a public um, writing. Wonderful wonderful to see this thank you. I like that you enlarge I like that you enlarge Narcissus how he sees himself the the photo the image. on the ah, cover. Yes. Yeah yes, yes we did. that yeah. one yes wonderful it looks wonderful Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Okay. Right. So um I was thinking how to uh, how to start this conversation uh but then I thought okay maybe we can start with you Sam and your story because you are the person who wrote this many years ago and it actually starts with your own story, right? Yes, I I was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder twice. And it uh, had a very negative effect on my life, actually it destroyed my life. So I came to regard it as an enemy. It's an enemy within, it's true. It's not an identifiable enemy without, but it's within. And that makes it an even more dangerous enemy than usual. So I uh, started to study narcissism. When I completed my studies in 1995, I wrote Malignant Self-Love as a manuscript. And just to be clear, at that time, no one has heard of narcissism. No one was talking about narcissism. It was a totally dead topic. The last book to have, pub to have been published was in 1974 by a guy called Alexander Lowen. And no one, no one paid any attention to narcissism. <laughs> It was not considered to be a, a major problem or an issue, something to be studied or of any interest, or it was considered to be a Freudian relic, a relic of Sigmund Freud. And today okay. it's bad, bad taste to study Sigmund Freud. He was not a scientist and therefore you should not study him. It's, it's wrong to study him. Psychology today is pretending to be a science, which it is not and can never be. But because of this pretension, we have lost many treasures of psychology. We have lost well over 100 years of psychology that are now not being taught in universities and frowned upon and so on. Anyhow, so I studied narcissism. And in 1997, Lydia has opened for me a website. And on that website, I uploaded the manuscript of Malignant Self-Love, the first edition. Of malignant self love. We made it free, free of charge. People could just read whatever they wanted. And uh, this was the first mention of narcissism online. We have ma we maintained the first website on narcissism for up until 2004. The second website was opened in 2004. We have we yeah. have we owned and moderated the first six support groups 
for narcissistic abuse. I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse. I coined most of the language in use today uh, because there was no language. There was no way for victims or for narcissists to describe the experience, the inner experience of being a narcissist and the experience of the victim uh, or the survivor together with the narcissist. So there was a need to invent a whole new language. And this is how this global movement of narcissism and narcissistic abuse started. Actually, it started in Skopje, in North Macedonia, from a single computer yeah. with a website. Yeah. And then, unbelievably, yeah. well over 250,000 people wrote back, informing us that the material has touched their lives, transformed their lives, made it possible for them to yeah. make sense and understand what was happening to them. Now, you should realize that 1997 was the very beginning of the internet. Yeah. Almost no one was on the internet. So 250,000 yeah. people then is like a few million people today. It's a ginormous yeah. number. So I, we realized that there would be a need for more structured help. And the first thing we've done is to publish the book. In 1999 was the first edition of the book. I did not want to publish the book. I did, want, did not want to continue with narcissism. I had other, other pursuits. And Lydia literally fished out of the garbage can the manuscript of Malignant okay. Self Love. She saved the book. Otherwise, there would have been no book. And I'm not quite sure there would have been a global movement of narcissistic abuse. So it's all thanks to Lydia, not to me. It's because, it's because I was also touched by a book. Uh, it explained it explained a lot about... We were talking while he was writing the chapters that I published one by one uh, on the internet. He was translating from, from his notebook what he was going through and I was uploading them. Yeah, it was tough because I didn't know anything about internet, about HTML language. I had to learn it. But the will to to explain it, to share it, was uh, from this distance, great idea. So I was interested. I had my own story. He had his own life before we met. I had my life. That was really not in a very good nine uh, years of the decade in the beginning of the 90s facing the co-ops of the environment i lived insecurity not safety uh troubles with people that they behaved in a very bizarre ways uh, so uh, i had some personal losses of very close people they turned out to be turned to be like nine in one year that was too much. And uh, there was different dynamic that I shared. As I was uh, receiving the material from Sam, I identified. So many others did also identified with, with themselves in certain situations. They seek help. And that is how we continue. That was something that, that gave and continued the will to, to proceed uh with the publishing to make the book and uh, it should have been uh uh for the people who wanted to understand that it's not all about them so that we encourage as i say it as a personal growth to everyone adaptive right. tools adaptive tools were were given to them to self-love themselves in a in a more positive manner, not in a selfish manner. So right. that now was... this sorry. No, please go. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Now this is the tenth edition, right? The and the book is yes. the tenth edition. And it's edition. amazing. It came to Mongolia and then now it's it's going to spread through Mongolia because um this is the word I also listened just a few years ago. And everyone starts to talk about narcissism and I didn't understand what it was. And I didn't understand, I was actually very close to a person who was, probably he has a, he had narcissistic personality disorder, but for sure narcissistic. 
And then I start to understand, I start to search and I found you on YouTube and I start to listen. And then I was dreaming about translating and then finally it's here. And um, I don't think there are many books actually in Mongolian about narcissism. And I think it's going to be one of the first books on narcissism in Mongolian language. So I think that a lot of people. Would you say that in Mongolian society, there's a problem of narcissism? Would you say it's a more or less narcissistic society? Because there are such societies in the world. Uh, well, well, I think, um, I think you mentioned about this is a um, disease of um, capitalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mongolia, is, Mongolia is still is a nomadic culture, but as city grows and people stay more in the city civilized, I think we are becoming more narcissistic. I see it everywhere. Now I can kind of spot people. <laughs> Sometimes when I talk, I, I can kind of spot it. So I think this is going to be very, very helpful. But um, again, because we don't have a lot of resources, people really don't understand what is narcissistic personality disorder and what is narcissism. So if you can explain to people yeah. about it. The greatest obstacle to coping with narcissism, managing narcissism, and then healing from narcissistic abuse, the greatest obstacle, is the absence of language, the, an inaccessible language, inability to express yourself. Mm -hmm. Words shape consciousness. The minute you have a word, the world makes sense. Words are meaning. In the absence of words, Everything that's happening to you is meaningless. And if it's meaningless, then you are not able to design any efficacious strategies, techniques, and ways to cope with your environment. That's why we place so much emphasis on literature, on science. On These are actually language tools. None of these disciplines of human endeavor actually touch or, or describe reality they describe our language so the first very important thing is education educating people as to what is narcissism what's the difference between gradations of narcissism because there's healthy narcissism there's narcissistic style and then there's narcissistic disorder they're not the same not everyone who is a bit selfish and a bit disempathic doesn't have empathy and a bit insensitive, not everyone like that is a narcissist. These are narcissistic traits. We call them narcissistic style in clinical literature. But they it's not the same as narcissistic disorder. And it's definitely not the same as narcissistic personality disorder, which is a type of cancer of the soul. Yeah. So education and the dissemination of language. And that's why what you're doing is very, very important is we give people the tools to communicate their internal experience and establish communities or around this experience and then support each other in the on the road to healing and recovery. Narcissism is a healthy thing. Everyone is a narcissist at age two, between ages two and four, and everyone is a narcissist between ages 12 and 18. And if they are not narcissists in these two age groups, then something is very wrong with them. Mm -hmm. They yeah. grow up to be people pleasers. They grow up to be codependents. And so narcissism is healthy in adolescence and even more healthy in childhood. And we... All of us have healthy narcissism. It is the foundation of self-confidence, self-esteem, a sense of self-worth, and even your ability to position yourself com comparably to other people with, within society. But pathological narcissism is something completely different. Pathological yeah. narcissism is infantile. It's the inability to perceive other people as separate from you because you, as a child, were unable to separate from your mother. You did not complete the separation individuation phase. You did not become an individual. So yeah. what narcissists do, they convert other people into internal objects. They internalize other people. And then they continue to interact with these internal objects. 
not with people out there, but with the representations of these people in their minds. And if you don't recognize that someone is not you, if you don't recognize that someone is separate to you, if you think everyone is your extension, if you think that everyone is inside your mind, then there's no place for empathy. Empathy is only with outside entities. There's no place for understanding, compassion, affection, attention. There's no place for taking care of catering to other people's needs and hopes and dreams and expectations. Other people become instruments. They're instrumentalized. And if they don't conform to the internal object in your mind as a narcissist, then the narcissist becomes aggressive and punitive. The narcissist yeah. punishes people for not conforming, for deviating, for diverging from the internal object. So narcissism involves what we, what we call externalized aggression. It's, it's in the same family like psychopathy, mm -hmm. cluster B, personality disorders. Many narcissists are actually on the verge of psychopathy, and they're known as psychopathic narcissists or malignant narcissists. And there is a lot of comorbidity. Comorbidity means that we diagnose two conditions in the same person. So comorbidity is very common between psychopathy and narcissism and between borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. The narcissist is unable to maintain relationships. He has very problematic attachment style. He is incapable of intimacy because he has learned as a child to associate intimacy and love with pain and hurt and rejection. All narcissists have been traumatized and abused as children. Now, there are many ways to abuse a child. You can abuse a child physically, you can beat the child up, you can abuse a child sexually, of course, and so on. But you can also abuse a child if you don't allow the child to separate from you as a parent. If you don't allow the child to establish boundaries, if you don't allow the child to come across reality, reality provides feedback, reality modifies, reality um, induces growth and development. So if you isolate the child, if you pamper the child, if you smother the child, if you spoil the child, if you pedestalize the child, if you idolize the child, all these are forms of abuse because the parent then uses the child as some kind of instrument, for example, to realize the parent's unfulfilled dreams and wishes. Okay. Or yeah. when the parent forces the child to become a parent, this is known as parentifying, and then the child is the parent's parent. That's also abuse. So parenting is a fine-tuning enterprise. You need to get it right 100%, because if you... <laughs> If you get any element wrong, that is traumatic and abusive because the child is defenseless. Oh my the God. child doesn't have a self, doesn't have any protection. It's a very delicate creature. It's very strange because um, I used to ask this question. So do nar uh, narcissistic personality disorder born or actually they become? So according to the book he wrote they actually become narcissistic narcissistic they they start to have narcissistic personality disorder because of abuses but then as you mentioned just right now abuse can be different forms and i can see just as an example around here when i see some people they send their children very expensive schools and every like whole day they send them to different courses uh, like they have to be perfect children as you mentioned wonderkind in a way but at the same time, do they really care about them emotionally? So that's the fear I, I have. And then in the future, I guess there are going to be many more narcissists. Or what do you think? Well, I will let Lydia answer that. But no. I will just make a comment no. before she does. Um, narcissistic personality disorder and pathological narcissism more generally, yes, they are the outcomes of improper upbringing, wrong parenting, not good enough parenting abuse and trauma in a variety of ways, not letting the child become his or her own person, not allowing personhood to emerge in, in many ways. But 
There are studies that indicate that some people, some children have a propensity, a disposition to develop narcissism. Mm. Because we have, for example, studies with twins. Twins who were raised by the same parents and so on. One of them becomes a narcissist, the other doesn't. So this is these are strong indications that there is some genetic or hereditary component and that the abuse and the trauma trigger these genes to express. Mm. And then the person becomes, acquires narcissistic personality disorder. But it is equally true to say that if you are not abused and if you're not traumatized, even if you have the genes, multiple genes, that predispose you to become a narcissist, you will not become a narcissist. Yeah. So the parental contribution is super critical. Yeah. Lydia can talk about society and the increasing narcissism in society and culture. Uh, this is vis-a-vis the 90s, what I, what I witnessed. And when I saw the different cultures uh, influencing my environment, I was born in socialist country. And uh, suddenly after that Yugoslavia dismantled, uh, capitalism was introduced. As you said before earlier, the, the influences the, that and and it was like imposed on us to behave like business people. Only business yeah. mattered. So where are the where the the human elements uh, got lost? The people became uh, more workaholics. They were spending more time uh, to be with other people, discussing business only. Not interested really in uh, in the others' affairs with their wives, children. That that help did not stop between us. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I found myself alone. Yeah. And uh, when uh, when I was asked to meet Sam, it was like, okay, you know what? Finally, you will have uh, his. He's clever. You can talk to him about you see how about de, you, you see how delusional she is. <laughs> so it, it was it was him. It's not that it's not that uh, I I was not acquainted with narcissism as a term because we had some uh, uh, lessons in uh, in philosophy classes and we were uh, learning about many authors. Uh, so. I, I knew about narcissism, but I didn't know about the dynamics. And when uh, 90s happened, when I started to actually ask myself, what was the motive of other people to behave in certain ways? I had to connect it with the misfortune of those times. And yeah. from very good people, they were suddenly overnight transformed in something they were not. As I knew them for 20 years, 50, 40, and so on. I am talking about my generation, younger, uh, and uh, much older than me. So the only connecting thing was uh, the response to the environment. It's uh, those who were uh, pretty sure about steady, safe, about their family, about their their uh, partners, children, about their co-workers. They were very stable. They were very rational. They were making one good decisions for them, for the closest one, for the society as well. Because I saw it also happening in the politicians that were changing all the time. So uh, the the empathy vanished, empathy vanished, uh, selfishness, materialism uh, popping, and the the children of those generation of of parents that belong to that generation. So I can see now these are the children uh, that they were kids at the time, right? I mean babies, formative years. I see them more narcissistic. I can yeah. compare because I lived with some children. I had friends who had children then, and I know what happened. And 
after 23 years, after 30 years, I know what happened with them. So yeah. I can make the difference uh, between uh, 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 children that were born in uh, unstable families, insecure, uh, usually because their parents were not giving them proper care. They were not uh, supporting them to, and they didn't teach them how to learn from the signs from other people that are in uh, living in their environment. In the 90s, my generation uh, already got their uh, universities and they were looking to go abroad. And they went, 70% of my generation in my school only went abroad. They thought they, are, they, are, they, they will be the, the businessman and whatever the capitalism it's, 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 introduced, okay. But this year in June, I met some of them and they were disappointed. They said, going there was like a black hole. It was not me and they returned, okay? So they couldn't actually be, allow themselves to belong to, to some capitalistic society. And mm. they were pretty angry as they described it. They were pretty angry that they lost the human element of not only being alone, but not having every, uh, anyone that will support them that will uh, have the same opinion uh, and will be more helpful by being, uh, and then uh, this world pop up to be, they are not merciful people there. So mercy contains many elements. I mean, psychodynamically uh, to someone to become a good person that a good person doing good to others, first to themselves, then to others, to the environment. And this is how uh, we all should expand. Yeah. Yeah, so just to finish, so uh, being selfish, being uh, suppressing uh, emotions by only to not be ashamed that you did not reach someone else's expectations is abuse. That is my term. Understanding. I will, yeah. I will I'll provide now a bit of a historic, historical context and a bit of a more sweeping overview. Lydia provides the personal touch, which mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately I cannot. But um, <clears throat> whenever there is uncertainty, there is anxiety. Whenever there's no way to reduce anxiety efficiently, there is fear. This anxiety is a very uncomfortable uh, inner feeling. And there is a sense of diffuse threat that you cannot pinpoint. That's why we call it anxiety. And people try to reduce anxiety in every way possible. And then if they fail consistently because the environment produces anxiety, induces anxiety all the time, then what they do, they withdraw. They withdraw from reality. They withdraw from the environment. And they withdraw using essentially two mechanisms, uh, addiction and narcissism. Addiction and narcissism are two escapist mechanisms, mechanisms of avoiding, shunning reality and developing a fantasy defense or using leveraging fantasy. Now, capitalism doesn't care. Capitalism is about maximizing profits. If there is profit to be made in manufacturing and consumption, then capitalism would emphasize manufacturing and consumption, would encourage you to consume, would build factories, consume more will build factories. This process is known as interpolation. Interpolation is a concept introduced by Louis Althusser. It's how society tells you how to behave. So capitalism follows, follows you. 
Everyone says capitalism is to blame. Capital, capital, capitalism is you. Yeah. And then, and then if there is profit to be made in addiction, and there is profit to be made in spectacle, in appearances, capitalism will follow you there, of course. Yeah. And this is precisely what has happened. Yeah. Okay. The capitalism of the last two, three decades is a capitalism of addictions, including addictive consumerism, and a capitalism of spectacle, display, theater. Yeah. So yeah. we see social media, for example. Yeah. yeah. It's a form of spectacle. But the underlying motivation is an escape from reality. Reality has become unbearable, and it has become unbearable for two reasons. Not only one. It is objectively unbearable. It contains a lot of uncertainty, a lot of change, technological and otherwise. Genders, gender roles are being redefined. The concept of family has been essentially destroyed. The institutions are falling apart. You can't trust anyone. Everyone is corrupt. So objectively, the environment is unbearable, intolerable. But there is a second reason. We tried everything. We tried Nazism, we tried communism, we tried capitalism, we tried, you name it, we tried it. We cannot come up anymore with new ideas. There are no new ideologies or new ideas left. We know that the solution, that the situation is unsolvable. There is no solution. It's the first time in human history mm. because in the 30s, you could lie to yourself and you could say the solution is communism or the yeah. solution is Nazism or the solution is fascism or the solution is capitalism or liberalism or democracy or you could lie to yourself. There was a lot of self-deception. Ideology is a virtual reality. It distorts. It distorts your thinking and make you, makes you conform, conform to an, a vision of the future that keeps you alive. In short, there's no hope. I think for the first time in human history, there's no hope. But I mean no hope, period. So if you put the two together, that the environment changes all the time, is in flux all the time, and therefore it's very threatening, you have to adapt constantly, literally every day you have to adapt, on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have no good reason to adapt. What for? There's no hope. Why to invest all this effort in staying alive? No good reason to stay alive. So you escape. You escape into drugs and into alcohol and into movies and into social media and into virtual and artificial reality and into you escape. Constantly escape. And of course, capitalism provides you with a means means to escape. That's all. It follow, it's a follower. Capitalism never initiates social movements or it's a follower. It goes where the money is. And where is the money? Where you are. It follows you like a shade, like a shadow. And this is the world we live in. It's a shadow world. It's a world where the shadow rules. Is there a way out? The, the real answer? No. There is no way out. Because the problems have to do with human nature. Mm not with anything that humans have constructed, not with society, not with ideologies, yeah. not with means of production, not with Marxism and not with capitalism. And not, this is all nonsense. This is all transitory. Mm -hmm. Capitalism will be forgotten a thousand years. The same way Rome has been forgotten a thousand years after it fell. That's not the issue. We are discovering, and this started with Freud, we are discovering that the problem is us. We have seen the enemy, and it is us. Not anything we have produced, but it's us. Something is wrong with us. Right. And so we are going to continue to generate incomplete, detrimental, destructive solutions. We are self-destructive, simply. Yeah, but we can, we can uh, be more aware. So my hope, I had a hope. I have yeah. always have hope. It's not connected to people. It's uh, uh, a hope that 
we it's embedded in us in each each one of us we have our characters we have good people not all of them are narcissists okay so if we just find out the uh, the good in us okay it's easy to get drunk to use drugs to prostitute and whatever okay you have to survive but uh to let also the the good aspects in us to prevail we all have gift for something if we cannot uh, uh if we are if we can't find it now during the school actually during the school uh, years uh uh you just uh, what everyone discovers what uh, some talent why not to go ahead with it why the teacher uh is jealous and this is these are excuses right why the uh, narcissistic teacher is envious and will uh not give a chance to the talented uh person to the talented kid to because such thing existed they always existed but now knowing more about narcissism you know people get uh more uh, uh, uh they are becoming more aware of their own qualities and uh the the thing that we all need is to just uh, succeed uh, to succeed in not in making money uh by stealing someone else's ideas for example but uh to make money of your own work of your own expression of your own potential when you realize that you're good in something you're good in uh in uh publishing right and you're good, uh, doing good thing you you're happy you are personally happy with yourself you are uh, other people will see it you know they will they will be encouraged just by by uh, looking at you as an example of your own success success is not to make a million dollars success is to do what you are good at so this mm -hmm. is my hope but it's personal it's, it's personal, personal. Not that, uh, it's not that it's <laughs> it's personal and it's also narcissistic it is but it's healthy narcissism because what lydia is saying actually the solution is with individuals right this is a narcissistic thing to say narcissism <laughs> what is narcissism and I, I did say that there is healthy narcissism what yeah. is narcissism narcissism is when you give up on the world when you say i am the solution i am the world i should affect my destiny my happiness i all the gifts and all the solutions are inside myself now this is not uh, lydia this is martin luther in the 16th century the big revolution of protestantism was not the negation of Catholicism or the Vatican or the Pope. That was not a big revolution because there have been similar movements before. The big revolution was, was when Martin Luther said, the seat of the divine is in the individual. We don't need priests. We don't need churches. We don't need any of these apparatus or mechanism or institutions. Each human is divine. The seat of the divine is in the individual. And it is the individual's role to make a better world by following God's commandments and so on and so forth. And God will bless you as an individual if you work hard, for example. This is known as the Protestant work ethic. If you work hard, God will choose you and bless you. And the very fact that you are rich proves that you have been chosen by God, that you've been blessed by God. Protestantism is the prototypical individualism. Mm -hmm. In the 16th century, we transitioned from collectivism to individualism. Even the concept of copyright, you had to pay me to publish the book. Why? This is a new practice. It's less than 200 years old. Until the 18th century, there was no such thing as author. You published a book, everyone was copying it and distributing it and so on. They didn't have any obligation, even moral, to identify the author. There was no individual. 
There's no individual. The concept of copyright and author is the individual. So we have transitioned to individualism in the 16th century and we never looked back and it only got worse and worse and worse. Collectivism suppressed the individual, but this is a mis misunderstanding, mis misapprehension. Collectivism, religion, for example, did not need to suppress the individual because there was no concept of individual. You mm -hmm. defined yourself through your affiliation with a group. You did not exist alone. You were embedded in a family, in a community, in a clan, in a tribe, and ultimately in a nation. Ask any Japanese. Yeah. So collectivism, because today uh, proponents, proponents of individualism, the prophets of individualism, they say, ah, say collectivism was bad because it did not allow the individual to express it himself. There was no need for the individual to express himself. There was no concept of self. The word self in psychology was first used at the beginning of the 20th century. That's very, very recent. Yeah. There was no perception of self. In the 17th century, there was a book written about depression. 17th century. That's 400 years ago. A book written about depression by Burton. The author's name was Burton. It's a book of well over 800 pages. You can't find the word self in the book. There's no such thing. I, me, mine, self, they're not in the book. It's new. It's totally new invention. I have so many questions. Now I'm like thinking, coming up with questions and losing it. <laughs> so um, I guess some people are listening to it right now and maybe because I'm going to put subtitles and probably some people are thinking, but what is actually narcissism? What, what narcissistic personality disorder do to other people? Like, what is the damage? What are the damages? And what are the characteristics of narcissistic personality disorder? I know you wrote about the nine characteristics, but if you have five of, five of them, um, you could diagnose your, not yourself, but you could be diagnosed as narcissistic personality disorder. But I also heard that it, it is changing now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this book needs to be revised. That's what I heard also from you from the uh, from the videos. So what are the characteristics and what actually what kind of damage they actually do to other people? Also for Lydia, I think I'm very curious about your dynamics because you've been together for, for such a long time and I've been with a narcissistic person and it was very, very difficult. And um, after just breaking up, I realized, what, oh, okay, I was there, I'm glad, now I'm not there. <laughs> so- I will, I will uh, cover the academic part and Lydia, Lydia will tell you how difficult it is to, and how long suffering she is with me. <laughs> um, I'm a narcissist, I can't suffer. Yeah. Academically, <laughs> Academically, speaking from the discipline's point of view, uh, narcissism is when you treat other people as objects. I think that's the best definition of narcissism, pathological narcissism. Oh, yeah. When you treat other people as objects, objects of gratification, instruments to obtain goals, etc., etc. When you can't empathize with other people in the sense that you don't see them as human, they are things. You thingify them. You make, you make them things. Now, this requires several behavioral traits, for example, exploitativeness, the tendency to exploit people, a lack of empathy, I, I mentioned, inability to access positive emotions. Narcissists are capable only of negative emotions, such as envy or rage, anger, or, you know, and so on and so forth. So we have nine, nine such uh, criteria described in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is a book used in the United States, mainly for insurance purposes. And if you if you meet five of these nine, then you can be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. If, of course, if you stop to think of it for a minute, you will see how nonsensical it is. Mm -hmm. Because if you meet criteria one, two, three, four, five, you're a narcissist. And if you meet criteria five, six, seven, eight, nine, you're a narcissist. But these yeah. two narcissists have nothing in common. Right. One to five and five to nine, they're not the same people. And yet they are diagnosed with the same disorder. So this led to the development of an alternative model of narcissism, which will be the diagnostic landscape 
in the next edition, in the sixth edition of the DSM. It is already incorporated in the ICD. ICD is International Classification of Diseases. It's a book published by the World Health Organization, and it codifies all the diseases of humanity, bodily and mental. And so it's much more advanced than the DSM. Also, it's much less influenced by money. Insurance companies and pharmaceutical industries have a huge effect on the DSM, not a good one. Oh, wow. So we, in the profession, we take the ICD much more seriously than the DSM, although the DSM, because of America's power, media power, the DSM is much more well known. Now, the alternative, alternative model is what we call a dimensional model. It says that narcissism is a spectrum, it's a dimension, and that you could have varieties of narcissism which are less pernicious, less problematic, more problematic, and so on and so forth. Narcissists maintain their identity or sense of identity and sense of self-worth by deriving input from other people. This is known as narcissistic supply. They are incapable of intimacy because they are not capable of perceiving other people as separate from them with their own needs and hopes and dreams and wishes and so on and so forth. They have problems with um, empathy. They have problems with aggression. They have problems with depression. And there are two types of narcissists. There is overt or grandiose narcissism. It's a narcissist whose self-perception and self-image is fantastic, inflated, unrealistic, not based on any real life accomplishments, megalomaniacal. That's the overt grandiose narcissist. And we have another type known as covert or vulnerable or shy or fragile narcissist. That's the a narcissist. Sorry? The, victim. the victim's victim mentality, right? Yes, that kind of narcissist is, uh, it, it fails to obtain supply. It's a, it's a mm. constant failure to obtain supply. It's known as collapse. Mm. So it's a form of collapse narcissism. And consequently, he develops victim mentality. He becomes very passive aggressive. He's very cunning and scheming and manipulative. Um, he's as disempathic, uh, lacking in empathy as the overt or grandiose narcissist. But he often has something called pseudo humility. He pretends to be humble, helpful, healer, savior, rescuer. These are very dangerous types because they yeah. fake and imitate empathy. They pretend to love other people, to, to support them, to, and they actually then inflict damage. When they get close to you, when they feign intimacy, which is not there, then they inflict damage. The grandiose overt narcissist is a bit stupid. It's a kind of Donald Trump narcissist, yes? In your face. That's who I am. I'm perfect. I'm amazing. I'm brilliant. I'm this, I'm that. And you're stupid and you're a loser. I'm a winner. And so, The covert narcissist, you don't see him coming. He's like a snake in the grass. Yeah. What? It's also on the I, 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 really, I really don't like this. It, uh, <laughs> most of the people are like that because they are indecisive. They 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 didn't de define themselves. If uh, uh, why why to be sneaky? What is wrong with you that you envy the other? What uh, what is uh, what are you ashamed of? Like you lack dreams, and someone else is just in a fan lives in a fantasy land and has like very easy life. No, what was that? Go lucky. Think? Happy go lucky. Happy go lucky. Fake it till you make uh, it. Fake it till you make it. You know, <laughs> these are the, the <laughs> Americanisms. <laughs> okay, yeah. so people in people's nature is to envy because we all have to compare with the other and to know more about ourselves. It's uh, what uh, narcissists need is narcissistic supply, the other's input. We also need other's input. Right? We need to know, we exchange opinions, we communicate, we come up with some idea, we, are, we realize that idea. Same uh, does the narcissist. But uh, 
uh, what is the difference that I will I will make it for for to be uh, most of us not only I to benefit but many other people to benefit all the involved not so the narcissist narcissist they they see everyone as a as an object it's their function to supply him with ideas uh, someone else's function to give him money someone else's money to invest in his uh, business and nothing with no responsibility to get uh, something in, in return, at least even thank you. They don't say it. They just withdraw, they vanish. And when, of course, uh, other people will also vanish. They gave part of them uh, something, you know, was... Uh, uh, produced or and and uh, there were some uh, money you know for everyone but the narcissist took them all for himself and he doesn't know what to uh, these people with ideas with money with they they leave and the narcissist fails he will lose all the money he doesn't know he doesn't have the brains it's also how to use it it is part of self-destruction what i call it uh the the dark side we all have the dark side uh you call it shadow i discovered later but uh the point in all this narcissist narcissism thing is uh that uh narcissists think and they are actually convinced that they matter only it's, yeah. We do, we do. Um, okay. We do. Okay. Uh, the, so, to since he said this, you asked before, how come we are together? When he says this, that only he matters, I learned from my parents. Uh, I had an abusive mother. I'm not going to talk about it. She, uh, she was asking... You must do this, have to do this, it's for family, it's for for all of us to be more happy. Okay, so give me what do you want me to do? I will make it just to for, to see your smile on the face, to be satisfied, and that but then leave me alone. This is my narcissistic uh pattern that I learned. So, but with that, in time I build boundaries. Yeah. Uh she was not fair for something she was uh, like a snake right trying you know from the other door but you will do also this and you will do also this but uh, I rejected her for many things I withdrew I was not talking to her for years even though I was teenager I was angry at her but I did not abandon her I did not uh, I did not uh, I was there for still keeping her uh, uh, pleased because she did have some positive uh, things. Uh, she had some uh, uh, good intentions, not to me, of course. I will give, uh, I will supply her, but what she gets, she will give to others. So I sustain her image of a good mother, but she knew very well that she was not good to me. However, she heard it and and that's it about her. That's the same dynamic that I learned from her that I am having with Sam. Okay, yeah. you are you are the, the captain, you know the best. Okay, what what is that that you want? I agree with it. I will please you, I will do it, but I will also enjoy that. You will not you just reject me, abandon me, or or whatever, dismiss me, but I will insist that I will stay here, I will help you, but also uh, you will help me when I need. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, like a blackmail also. I'm give, not happy give, with that. Give and take. But, but there is a relationship that is fair. Transactional. It, it's, mm -hmm. uh, but transactional for good for both of us. Right. Okay, that is because of my upbringing. I was good to everyone. Until today, I'm good with everyone. That is my... But when they cross the line, when I see the, the hint of not being fair, and there is nothing... I, I ask for a favor, right? 
and there is nothing in return. That person is, you know, I can't trust that person anymore. I can't rely on that person anymore. And that's it. What Boone does is that he is honest, even brutally honest. That, yes. is, that is the real bondage. It's not uh, the trauma bond that I had. From the trauma bond that I had, I learned something. But with him, I, I, uh, in, I implement the, all the knowledge that I had in the past, not only from home, but with many other people. So it's a good feeling to live with yourself, knowing, being aware that uh, snakes, that people provoke you for different reasons, and you should be smart to know where to engage and where whom to help. Is it for both of you? Is it for mutually, uh, mutually beneficial? Yes, is it mutually beneficial? So I think that malignant self love is that product of me and Sam. It's our only child, by the way. We don't have children. <laughs> yeah. So there are two types of um <laughs> you said uh, Cerebral narcissists and somatic narcissists. Mm -hmm. Cerebral cerebral narcissists are very smart. It's they have a lot of I know such people here as well. And sometimes I think it's really pity sometimes because they're amazing. They really have a lot of knowledge, speak so many languages, but um, they sometimes really act like a child, vulnerable child. And so it is very hard to be with a child as an adult. <laughs> so I guess that's, does it apply to also somatic narcissists? Yeah, well, this, <laughs> that's a long question. <laughs> I will try to break it up. And then uh, I would like to talk a bit about envy, shame, and dissociation. These are critical features of narcissism. When, when the child is exposed to trauma and abuse, the child has two options. He can merge with the abuser. This is a process known as identification, introjection, incorporation. So he can merge with the abuser, he can become one with the abuser. And this kind of child grows up to be a narcissist. The other option is to cater to the needs of the abuser, to please the abuser. This kind of child becomes codependent or a people pleaser when he grows, when he grows up. The child who becomes a narcissist he, as I said, he merges or fuses with the abuser, but he's still suffering pain. He's still being punished. He's still being ignored or being uh, violated. He needs to isolate himself from these impacts. And yet, at the same time, he needs to be an abuser. So he constructs a godlike imaginary friend a yeah. godlike imaginary friend known as the false self. Right. And he creates the equivalent of a private religion. The false self is godlike. It's all knowing, it's all powerful, and it protects the child. It defends the child against the abuse of parental figures or caregivers. So when the child is beaten up or sexually molested or instrumentalized, or parentified or whatever, it's not happening to the child, it's happening to the false self. Okay. This is a decoy yeah. mechanism, decoy. Like it's happening, not to me, it's not happening to me. I'm not here, I'm not here. I'm not here is known as dissociation. It's happening to him, to this, to the false self. And then the child, because this is a God, the false self is a God, the child sacrifices himself to this God. This is human sacrifice, like in yeah. primitive religions. Mm -hmm. He sacrifices himself. He sacrifices his true self to this God. And by sacrificing himself to this God, he becomes one with this God. He becomes one. From that moment on, all that's left is the false self, this imaginary friend, this piece of fiction, it's a story, it's a narrative, it's not real. The child itself vanishes forever, can never be recovered, is dead. 
zombified, if you wish. Now, the false self is godlike. So it needs to be superior. It need, needs to be perfect. So the child asks, it asks itself, what am I good at? What am I good at? If I take my assets, my advantages, and leverage them, develop them, invest in them, then I'm going to be perfect. Then I'm going to be superior. If I'm intelligent and I study a lot and I learn a lot, then I'm going to be superior to other people. I'm going to be almost perfect, or perfect actually. I'm going to be a walking, talking encyclopedia. Yeah. yeah. So this is the cerebral narcissist. Other children are tall, they look good. Girls, girls get attracted to them when they are teenagers, or boys yeah. get attracted to them when they're teenagers, and so on and so forth. And so they say, my asset, my advantage is my looks, my body. Yeah. That's how I'm going to become superior. That's how I'm going to become perfect. So I'm going to exercise a lot. I'm going to lift weights. I'm going to body build. I'm going to have sexual conquests. I'm going to have sex all the time. It will confirm to me that I'm perfect, that I'm superior, that I'm, that I'm irresistible. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the child makes a decision very early on, between ages four and six, makes a decision. So, These are my assets, and that's the way, that's the only way I can become superior and perfect. And they mm -hmm. become cerebral or somatic. But there is no time constancy. When the cerebral fails, collapses, for some yeah. reason, he becomes somatic. Oh, wow. And when the somatic fails, for some reason, for example, he cannot get uh, sexual partners, for some reason, or, or he had an accident, he's disabled. So when the somatic fails, he tries to become cerebral, which is very funny. They look like clowns. <laughs> he tries to become cerebral. Then he thinks, he suddenly believes that he's a genius, he's a philosopher, is a, a psychologist, is I don't know what, and you see these these clumps of muscles online who suddenly become public intellectuals because of, yeah. because they have failed the somatics, and so you see all these bodybuilders and all these uh, you know, and they are online and they they pretend to be big intellectuals and big, but they don't have the capacity, so they, it's very clownish. So this is to answer your question about somatic and, and cerebral. There's a dominant type and a recessive type, latent type. And when the dominant type fails, the other type takes over. And then and, and flip-flop. It's a flip-flop situation. Separately from all this, we I think it would be good to discuss envy, shame, and dissociation. These are three yeah. critical forces in narcissism. Um, when the child is abused and traumatized, the child feels helpless and very ashamed of itself. When you fail to defend yourself, when you fail to stand up to yourself, when you're bullied all the time, you feel ashamed, don't you? It's a very yeah. shaming reaction. Failing. It. Failing in general. Generally, yes, she's right. Failing in general. Failing is in general is shameful. And this is the failure. You're failing to protect yourself. Your body, your mind, your soul, everything. It's a massive failure. There's another failure here. You're failing to become who you could have been. Mm. You're failing to realize your potential. Okay. You get stuck. You get stagnated. You remain a child forever. And yes, you're right. The average mental age is about two. So, wow. So you're an adult. You, you watch adults around you. And, can't and you can't reach the level. It challenges your sense of perfection. It undermines your grandiosity and and false and this creates a lot of shame and vulnerability and fragility. So shame is a critical function, and narcissism is compensatory. It compensates for the shame. If you feel inside that you're weak, you will pretend to be strong. If you feel that yeah. you're stupid stupid you will pretend to be a genius like me if you so whatever you if you feel that you're ugly you will go on a, on sexual conquest to prove to yourself that you're not ugly narcissism is totally compensatory now we know there was a big debate for 40 years 
Now we come to accept that it is 100% compensatory, even in grandiose laws. So this is shame. So it, it, just to say, sure. as, as the things in the environment change and uh, uh, people are becoming anxious, they can't, they are afraid of the future. The, they, they come with very bizarre ideas, <laughs> what to do, who they are. So, you know, this is that stage when uh, uh, of, uh, and then you compare with the others, uh, you you uh, find out that something is wrong with you, so you also, your narcissistic defenses pop up. So it's a loop, you know, one goes into the other. Yeah, this is known as relative positioning. I'll come to it in a minute. Okay. The second thing is envy. Obviously, mm -hmm. if you feel inferior, inferiority complex, you feel incomplete, you feel inadequate, you feel imperfect. You envy other people. You envy other people for their accomplishments, for their looks, for their uh, wives and girlfriends or boyfriends, for their property, whatever. Envy is actually a diagnostic criteria uh, in narcissism. It's one of the nine diagnostic criteria. Envy motivates not only covert narcissists, but also grandiose narcissists. And it is the twin of shame. Mm -hmm. This is an intolerable situation. How can you survive with constant shame and constant envy and the need to disguise them, camouflage them with behaviors and traits that are not fully yours? You know that you're acting. It's a lot of acting here. Mm -hmm. So how can you survive this situation? You forget. You simply delete. A lot of forgetting. And this is this amnesia is known as dissociation. Narcissists have enormous memory gaps. And because they have huge memory gaps, every situation that caused them shame, every situation where they were envious, every time they were criticized, every time someone disagreed with them, every time they thought they were being insulted, this is known as hypervigilance. Every so every two minutes, they have to dissociate. Wow. They end up not remembering, disremembering 80% of their life. That's why they, so, need, they need someone next to them. Yes. That is my like role. To, 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 to No, to rely. Uh, remind, remind. Uh, to, to remember all the details of their lives. Yes. So that is exhausting. And um, <laughs> yeah. not many women can, can tolerate that. It's a burden. Yeah. It's a burden. This is part of something known as external regulation. Like the borderline, the narcissist hands over internal processes to his intimate partner. He expects her to act as his memory, as his narcissistic supply, as his so she is, she becomes integrated in his mind as an external supplier. Exactly like internet service provider. So there's, but, uh, there's a computer and there's hard drive. <laughs> yes, like external hard drive. It's an example. I, 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 I on one, uh, there was a seminar in London. I said, I have his ex external hard disk. <laughs> so. Yeah. so this is this is dissociation. And that makes the situation even more unbearable. Because yeah. to, to justify, to explain to people the memory gaps, mm -hmm. the narcissist creates confabulations. Lies. Confabulations are not lies. Confabulation. Well, they appear to be lies. They're not lies. Confabulations are stories that make sense to the, the, to the narcissist. The narcissist says, I forgot the last five minutes. What could have happened? What is likely to have happened? What most probably has happened? What's, what plausibly has happened? And then he creates a story and it becomes reality for him. He, wow. he bridges, he he bridges he the memory brings. gaps. He bridges the memory gaps with mini stories that he comes to believe are reality, even when they are contradicted by evidence. Just to sustain yeah. the, the false image. Continuity. Yes. And that we I call it reframing. So there was a situation that didn't fit you, or you forgot that. It happened, you remember some snippets, shots, and then you make your own story. Not, I mean, you like a narcissist, and they, well, but this happened, 
weight of so there you can't you can't change the mind of a narcissist. He is he believes that. So this uh, I saw how desperate they are to be them to stabilize I don't, I don't... to stabilize themselves identity uh, that they are that they are having control because yeah. they know and they are aware very much so of their dark side they call it uh, these days dark triads the the urges that they cannot control and it's easy for them to flip so the narcissist i they are so predictable when they flip and when, and if they put you in the story be sure to expect to be blamed to be accused and even to be taken to court that they are so convinced in their narrative. It's unbelievable. Sorry to... No, no. Um, when, when your life is 80% confabulation and 20% reality, then you live in a story. And this story is known as fantasy. It's a fantasy mm -hmm. defense. But if you inhabit uh, an alternative universe, it's known clinically as paracosm. If you inhabit a paracosm, an alternative universe, which is comprised of 80% invention, invented thing, 20% reality, then your partner must join your universe. Because mm. if your partner is 80% reality and you are 80% fantasy, you will not survive as a couple. Yeah. There will be a lot of friction, a lot of debates, a lot of anger, a lot of you're lying, you're not lying, no, I'm not lying, yes, I'm lying. So, your partner must make the choice to join your fantasy. And this is known as a shared fantasy. There is a process called coercive snapshotting. I will not go into all this. But she joins the fantasy, in effect. Even if she thinks she had not joined the fantasy, even if she thinks she's embedded in reality, if she survives with the narcissist, she has joined his fantasy. Yeah. Period. Um, so now, she has to lose herself as well, in a yes. way. Part. 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 The part of reality testing. If she has to give up on her independent view of reality, on an independent gauge of reality. Now, victims mistake this. They say it's gaslighting. It's not gaslighting. Mm. Gaslighting is intentional, goal-oriented. Consequently, it is psychopathic. When the psychopath gaslights you, he knows what is reality, and he knows that he's lying. He knows that he's manipulating. The narcissist believes his fantasy. He is the fantasy. He doesn't know that he's lying to you. He, he firmly believes that it's all true and real. When he promises you to marry you, the second time you meet, yeah, to marry you and have children with you, he is not future faking. He is not lying to you in order to get you to bed, to have sex with you. That's the psychopath. The narcissist really believes that he's a, you will get married and have children with you. Because he is in the fantasy and he doesn't remember. So the next day, he may tell you, you know, uh, let's try it out for a few years and see how it goes. And so, but yesterday you offered me marriage and he doesn't remember. So he would confabulate. He would say, You must have imagined it, you were drinking a lot. <laughs> and then you, um, you produce a recording, you produce a recording on your smartphone where yeah, he yeah. says, I'm going to marry you and we are going to have three children. And you are debating the names of the children. Yeah. <laughs> and he would still deny it. Yeah. Yeah, desperate. He would say you took it out of context. Right, that's that's true. Yeah. So there's um I think there's a misunderstanding among a lot of people, especially here, because we don't have a lot of resources. I talk to a few people and then they say, Ah, narcissists, they are the people who deeply fall in love with themselves they're they're the people who only love themselves and this is i think this is very wrong according to the book your book actually those are the people who have no idea how to love themselves therefore they, they don't know how to other, love others right so they, they i don't think have, it's even much worse they don't have a self yes they can't okay. love themselves because they are selfless ironically <laughs> and, and narcissism most most of the people who are saying that they are reverting to more obvious type of narcissist, and it's the somatic one. 
because they want to be beautiful. Even there, gonna... even there there's no such I mean, most of these narcissism, people are referring to somatic narcissism. Narcissism is early childhood failure to develop self structures, including the ego. Narcissists don't have ego, an ego. Yes, they have super ego. They, they don't have an ego because they have a false self. Exactly. So, narcissism is about a failure to develop a self. There is no self love because narcissism is a huge reservoir of shame. Yeah. Narcissism is a reaction to shame. There's yeah. re self rejection, self loathing, self hatred, self destructiveness. Narcissism is the exact opposite yes. of self love. Yeah. Yeah. The exact opposite of self love. And what they, why they are, uh, why they need someone to love them is actually that they are, and they are choosing uh, empathic. Um, empathic uh, partners in life because yeah. they love really they love themselves they care about themselves you know a norm a normal person and the 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 jealousy and envy that they can't do it to themselves they just take it uh, as it is from the other they consume the other they consume yeah. they see what the other is uh, does how is taking care of uh, himself, herself in this. They copy it. So they are, when they you have an example of someone who loves yourself, every time you want, you miss it. Whenever a narcissist will feel self-destructive, self-hated, okay, they go to that source and they are joyful again, wonderful again, accepted, they belong. So they compensate with the other with the other's emotions because they don't have they can't relate to In positive the... emotions so many women will say uh, that the narcissist drained them emotionally they, they became dead they died and they call them uh, vampires they suck the life out of, out of them so these are, are just you know how people express such dynamics and to answer your question, and this is actually where, why, uh, what is the real reason of envious narcissists? Because they know they can't do it, because yeah. they they don't have emotions. That is how come they have. I will destroy the other just not to irritate me, that to remind me that I am emotionless. And to answer your question. The narcissist cannot love anyone, and you also can never love a narcissist. I will explain mm -hmm. the second part, and then I will talk about the first part. This is this would be a big surprise to many victims. Right. Yeah. When I say you can never love a narcissist, it's a, it's a big surprise. But I will explain why. First of all, the narcissist is not real. There's nobody there. It's an yeah. absence, absence pretending to be a presence. Yeah. The narcissist does not exist. It's a void. It's a black hole. You can never love something like this. Ever changing. And if you love the what you think is the narcissist, what you are in love with is an idealized image of an intimate partner that you created in your own mind. It's not the narcissist. You fell in love with a fake hero, a, a fiction character. That's the first reason. Mm -hmm. There's an even bigger reason. To seduce you and lure you and captivate you and get you addicted, what the narcissist does, he puts a mirror to you. A mirror. Yeah. And in the mirror, you see your idealized self. Yeah. In the mirror, you're perfect, you're amazingly intelligent, you're irresistible, you're drop-dead gorgeous, you are unique, you are incredible, you are unprecedented. In the mirror, what do you fall in love with? You fall in love with your idealized image in the narcissist's mirror. You fall in love with yourself through the narcissist's gaze. The narcissist provokes in you your own narcissism. And yes. you, you yes. develop a narcissistic <laughs> love for yourself. That's why it's addictive. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. The narcissist has a monopoly on this mirror. He is the only one with this mirror, so you think. He's the only one with this mirror. If he takes it away from you, suddenly you have to face the fact that you are not perfect, that you have shortcomings and failings, and, you know, and who wants to face this after having experienced perfection? Mm -hmm. It's a drug. See, it's a see, drug. It is like, actually, that's your validation. Yes. How you see yourself in the in his eyes is your narcissistic supply. Yes. Because we all doubt that we're never good enough. How we look, how we perform. That's why we are all narcissists. Yeah, narcissistic. That is the healthy narcissism because it motivates us to change our mind and so on and so forth, to regulate emotions. But, and but so of course, if you were raised in a dysfunctional family where you did not receive a lot of love. You were criticized all the time, so you develop what we call a bad object. You, f you feel that you are unworthy, inadequate, ugly, stupid, because your mother told you so, for example. This kind of, of person is much more vulnerable, much more susceptible mm. to the whole of mirror's effect. Yes. This yeah. kind of person, when she sees herself in the mirror, and she is suddenly not ugly, not stupid, not unworthy, not inadequate, superior, amazing. She cannot resist it. And gives up. That's why borderlines, for example, are very attracted to narcissists. That's a mechanism that's, of binding. That's, 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 that's the trauma bonding. By the way, half of all narcissists are women. So when I say he, it's a she and so on. So Do they, they, they equal themselves. It's not 70 yeah. men, yeah, but now they're and so there's um I, I I have some question came out. So um so this mirroring, so when you spend a lot of time with the narcissistic person, um I forgot the word, the term, but contagious narcissist, you become a part of part of it and actually you become kind of a narcissistic, or you become like fully narcissistic, or you become a kind of narcissist, but not really. Like how does it work? However, however, you you uh, accepted by that you accepted the shared fantasy mm. yes okay that's the, the thing that's true uh, people who are exposed to narcissists mm. suffer trauma yeah this is not an acute trauma the trauma known as ptsd it's not it's another type of trauma known as complex trauma cptsd now People with CPTSD and all, everyone who is ex exposed to a narcissist, intimate partner, friend, family, neighbor, priest, doctor, medical doctor, everyone exposed to a narcissist, even by the way, sometimes within a few minutes, suffers trauma. It could be mini, mini, mini trauma. Then he would just feel uncomfortable after, after meeting the narcissist. He would feel disgusted. He would feel uncomfortable. You feel ill at ease. You'll want to wash yourself. You will feel like you're dirty. Some, something bad happened here. I met some entity. It's not human. Or I don't know what. You, you feel bad. And we call this ego dystony. You will feel ego dystony. So even a short exposure to a narcissist causes trauma. And of course, very long exposure causes massive complex trauma. Now, complex trauma involves elements, psychological elements, psychopathological elements from borderline personality disorder so it involves emotional dysregulation your emotions are so strong they overwhelm you you're mm -hmm. incapable of managing your emotions they come they come suddenly they take over you you freeze you uh, this is this is known as startle response you so yeah. your emotions are stronger than you this is known as emotional dysregulation this element is borrowed from borderline you become narcissistic in the sense that your empathy goes down. Your ability to empathize goes down. You become very defensive, arrogant, more arrogant. Uh, your self-perception and self-image become a lot less realistic, more inflated, more grandiose. These are all narcissistic yeah. defenses. Yeah. You become dissociative. You begin to forget things a lot. Deny. Or deny things, but also forget, simply forget. So this is dissociative. And oh, what is forgetting things? Because this is really resonating with me in a way. Start to forget things. 
It's a narcissistic oh, defense. Oh, oh. It's a narcissistic defense. The, wow. the narcissist <laughs> renders you, converts you into a cluster B basket. You become wow. partly borderline, partly narcissist, and partly psychopath. So you will become vengeful, for example. You become vindictive. You become violent or at least externally aggressive. You will, you will become defiant. You will become contumacious, rejecting authority. Mm. All these are features of complex trauma. To the point that many scholars, including the woman who coined, who invented, who discovered complex trauma, Judy Thurman, many scholars, myself included, we propose mm. to consider all cluster B personality disorders as post-traumatic conditions with emotional dysregulation, not as personality. So the victims then, depending on the exposure, depending on the type of narcissist, covert narcissists have much worse effect than overt because they create confusion, disorientation. So depending on many factors, the effects can last a few months, but it's, it's common for the effects to last many years. Yeah. Five years, six years, yeah. Okay, that's a good because. No. And another thing is, just with your permission, another thing very important thing: the narcissist implants in your head, puts in your head mm -hmm. a voice. This this process is known as introjection. You introject the narcissist. He, there is a voice in your head that represents the narcissist. There's an internal object which is the representation of the narcissist in your mind. And the narcissist uses something called entraining. Entraining mm -hmm. is simply verbal abuse that keeps repeating itself over and over until you are essentially brainwashed. Yeah. So, and then there is this voice of the narcissist. And even when he's dead, physically dead, or gone, you broke out. You never see him again. You're no contact. You got married, remarried, and you have six children. And you his, have voice, <laughs> his voice is inside your head. Always... And the problem is this. The narcissist voice inside your head, the narcissist is your enemy, remember, because you broke up with him. You are now the enemy. You are a secretary object. He wants you dead. He wants you finished. He wants you in prison. He wants you whatever. So the narcissist voice inside your head is an enemy voice. And it collaborates with all the other enemy voices in your head. It creates a coalition. So if your mother was an enemy, for example, the narcissist voice would collaborate with your mother's voice. And they would create wow. a coalition, introject, introject you into objective coalition. And these voices will attack you together. So when you hear the narcissist's voice in your mind, at the same time, you will hear your mother telling you he is right. He is right about you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if the narcissist tells you, for example, you're so naive, you're such a people pleaser, mm -hmm. you're so stupid. Suddenly, there will be a second voice, which is essentially your mother's voice, who will tell you, you see, I told you the same. You see, I'm right. Yeah. This this is the power of the nuts. So in effect, the, we all have introjects from, and we uh, we remember uh, from our childhood because we had to respond to mama's needs, to what what the mother will say. Don't don't go there. Don't do this. Don't behave like this. Don't cross the street without whatever. All the people. All the people you met in your life. Significantly. Important. If all the people you met and you learned something from them to uh, that help you to to you to create your identity. Okay? They are your introjects for life, even though they are dead. This is who you really are. So yeah. you you are defined by other people. In your developing uh, years, and uh, people that you may uh, met when you were experiencing mostly trauma, mostly trauma, because that is hard to overcome. So if you if you don't uh, know how to self care when you're in pain, what you should do, and which narrative actually would sustain your identity, your character that you chose before, you will not feel 
uh, a, a victim to that extent, you will be more uh, defined as a person. So when uh, the narcissist uh, will come in your environment, you have to, to meet. Uh, and you have sense for you. Already you develop sense of who you are. Then it would, what you will, when you will meet a narcissist, charming, whatever, or overt, uh, you will ask yourself, what's wrong? These are the red flags, you know, uh, what women are talking. But when you will meet a psychopath, you don't have to exchange a word. If your senses are uh, in, in, uh, attuned. in balance, attuned with your, with your emotions, with your reasoning, with your personality, okay? When you will meet a uh, psychopath, you want to run. You will. You don't need to 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 say a word. There, uh, you will feel fear. You will be afraid. Uh, and that's why Sam said, uh, "You sweat and you want to to take a shower after that, like you you are dirty." Many people experience that. But yeah. and what I'm saying, and uh, to my clients, I'm counselor for CPTSD is to to go back to their own uh senses senses and to uh try to experience many more other things and uh to reconnect them to reframe them uh with the introject the experiences that they had before so they will you know like negate the positive experiences today will negate the the bad introjects from before. So in this way, uh, we called it, I call it reframing. It's a mm -hmm. it's a pretty good new start. And uh, many because you said that you you feel some resonance, that's why I'm <laughs> giving you this. Many people should just be uh, to from time to time remind themselves okay you are living with with a narcissistic husband you know it is ex expected from him i know who, now everyone what sam said in the beginning they have a definition a language right they can define <laughs> and they will know with whom they are dealing and how to protect themselves we all have that power because the life in us uh, pushes us to just survive and you will survive a narcissist as simple as that. No need to complicate things. No need to go, you know, to make a lot of drama because this border is borderline joke. <laughs> Not the normal persons or the victims. No victim, uh, no victim uh, 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 says uh, that is suffering. He is saying, mm -hmm. he said to you, my long, or he introduces me like long suffering wife. I don't see it as I'm suffering. I'm learning from it. I, I'm thankful because I discover my dark side. I know okay. what I'm made of. So who who gets the the best part of the cake? Hmm? Let's share it. And again, and again, it's a question of calculus. It's a mathematical question. If the vast majority of introjects in your inside your head are negative the narcissist would have a much easier job of taking over you mm -hmm. and you will have a much more difficult job of getting rid of his voice in your mind because he would have many more allies inside your mind. Mm -hmm. But if, you're, if your upbringing and childhood and later life, majority of the voices inside your head are loving and caring and supportive and helpful, and then the narcissist would have a much more difficult job to take over you you will probably get rid of a narcissist much earlier yeah. and the narcissist voice inside your mind will be silenced by the others, especially yeah. by your authentic voice. Every human being has a single voice, which is that person, not mother, not father, not family, not friends, that person's voice. It's known as the authentic voice. So it depends. Narcissists who target damaged and broken women do it for a purpose. They're much easier to convert. Right, of course. <laughs> much easier to convert. And much easier to hoover. Mm -hmm. Even after there's a breakup and, you know, 
it's much easier to reacquire them, to get them back. Because yeah. the voice is there. It, the Trojan horse is inside the mind. It's there, it's working. You know. Okay, I have um I have also um, okay, I, I'll ask you three questions, uh, I think, because before I forget <laughs> so um the second grade supply or first grade supply, and who really becomes first grade and who becomes second grade, first of all. And second, um, I read a lot on your book and listened that narcissism never heals, which is quite sad. But then now you said this contagious narcissist people can heal after a few years or a few months, which is a good news. And um, the third question is, what is the difference, really difference between psychopathic person and narcissists? I think there's a difference between empathy because I recall you talked about cold empathy Narcissistic people have some sort of empathy called cold empathy, but psychopaths have no empathy at all. Is this true? Mm, no, I'll start with the last question. Both of them have mm. cold empathy. Mm. Both narcissists and psychopaths have cold empathy. The difference between narcissists and psychopaths is that psychopaths are goal-oriented, and the goal could be sex, money, power, access, luxury life, whatever. The narcissist is not goal-oriented. His only goal is narcissistic supply. So the narcissist is a junkie. The psychopath is an operative, functional entity that maximizes or optimizes outcomes. The narcissist is a junkie and he's after supply. So therefore, the psychopath is not dependent on other people. He is mm -hmm. ironically not pro-social and communal as the narcissist. The narcissist depends on other people for narcissistic supply. So he must work with other people. He must please other people. He must somehow interact with other people. He suffers. <laughs> he is integrated with other people. He hates other people. He holds other people in contempt because he is godlike and superior. But unfortunately, he is dependent on other people for narcissistic supply. The psychopath is not. The psychopath very often is a loner, a lone wolf. He mm -hmm. doesn't care about other people because they, there's nothing they can give him except, for example, money. So he doesn't care what they think about him. He doesn't need supply. None of this. Plus, many of the features of narcissism do not exist in psychopathy. Online, there are many self-styled experts. It's a catastrophic phenomenon. They are spreading, they are spreading misinformation left, right, and center. It's a disaster. And some of these experts have academic degrees, some of them are even psychologists, but they're not experts on narcissism. So some of these so-called experts are saying that all psychopaths are narcissists. That is rank nonsense. Only a small percentage of psychopaths are also narcissists. Mm -hmm. The overwhelming majority of uh, psychopaths are not. They're grandiose, but they're not narcissists. So no no dependency on other people and the the psychological composition or landscape of narcissism is not the same like psychopaths for example psychopaths don't have dissociation don't can, don't engage in fantasy do not do not have uh, the same kind of shared fantasy like the narcissist don't uh, they so the differences are huge i would even say that psychopathy should not be a mental health issue should not be defined as a clinical entity. A psychopath is simply who ref someone who refuses to play by the rules. Mm. Refuses to play by the rules and doesn't care about other people. But he recognizes, for example, that other people are external to him, not like mm. the narcissist. He is firmly embedded in reality. Psychopath is very grounded in reality. Narcissist is not. Mm -hmm. Psychopath couldn't care less what you think about him. Narcissists will fall apart if you don't give him supply. Mm -hmm. it's, these are critical differences. So I don't think I think psychopathy is wrongly defined as a mental health issue. It's a social problem, not a mental health problem. And um, so this is with regards to the second. With regards to your first question. In my early work, I, I suggested that not all supply is the same. Depends who is the source of narcissistic supply. If I get a compliment from Albert Einstein, it's not the same if I get a compliment from the from my neighbor, yeah. obviously. If Einstein says you're a genius, 
or my neighbor says I'm a genius, it's not the same. It doesn't have the same impact. It doesn't last as long. So I suggested that there are grades of narcissism. I also suggested that there is fake, fake supply. Fake supply is when you pretend to give me supply, but I realize that you are trying to play me, to game me, to deceive me, to manipulate me. You're giving me supply to manipulate me. This is fake supply. There is low grade supply that comes from idiots. And I don't know what, it means nothing to me. On the contrary, it may even insult me. May even have, so there's negative supply. Negative supply is something that looks like supply, sounds like supply, but actually causes me narcissistic injury. Mm -hmm. So they are, there's a whole theory of supply. It's, uh, it's very detailed. Very. I forgot what was the second question, which proves that I'm not a genius. You answered the question. Oh. Do they heal? So they never heal. Oh, healing, healing. Yeah. Yeah. True. Heal. <laughs> the victims of narcissistic abuse do not become narcissists. Mm -hmm. There, everyone has narcissistic defenses. Every human being alive and many human beings dead have narcissistic defenses. So the narcissist triggers your narcissistic defenses. The narcissist also provokes psychopathic behaviors and the narcissist dysregulates you emotionally so you look a lot like a borderline. But it doesn't mean that you become a borderline or that you become a narcissist or that you become a psychopath, no. CPTSD is transitory and that's the difference between CPTSD and borderline personality disorder. That's why it is nonsense. Again, self-styled experts online are saying CPTSD is borderline. No, it's not. Borderline is lifelong. It ameliorates. It's mitigated in the, in, in the patient's 40s. When the patient is 40, 45, borderline goes down. But it's, it's lifelong. It starts at age 12. CPTSD is always transient. It lasts a few months, a few years in extreme cases, and then it disappears. It reverses completely. The very good news. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it is. Prognosis is very good. So, so will okay. narcissist ever heal? No. Narcissism yeah. is not narcissism is not a new fashion. You can take off your clothes. Narcissistic personality disorder is the personality. This is who the narcissist is. That's the essence of the narcissist. If you take away the narcissistic personality disorder, nothing is left behind. There's also nothing to work with in, with a patient that is outside the disorder. That's why the DSM says that narcissistic personality disorder is all pervasive. Yeah. It permeates everything, every emotion, every cognition, every affect, Every field of functioning, every area of life, every behavior, every trait, every reaction, every everything is affected and defined by pathological narcissism. There's no way to take it away because then there would be no patient left. So, you okay. know, narcissism cannot be healed. What can be done is to modify some abrasive and antisocial behaviors of the narcissist. To teach the narcissist to be more socially acceptable, to sublimate, to convert some things into socially acceptable behaviors, and so on and so forth. Even then, it's very short-term effect. You, you, work, forget. you work with the narcissist for three years, and you are very happy, and you 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 are you become a narcissist yourself. I, I I healed that narcissist. He now knows how to behave in society. He's not insulting people, he's not exploiting people, he's not manipulating people, he's not abusing people. Wonderful. In essence, he's no longer a narcissist. I modified all his behaviors. And if you're lucky, this lasts for six months. Or until the narcissist is stressed. Or until he thinks that you've insulted him. Mm. It's nonsense. It's simply yeah. nonsense. There's no way to change a narcissist. And victims will do well to stop with malignant optimism and what Shadow De Angelis, uh, a narcissism uh, uh, Instagrammer, calls pathological hope. They will do well to get rid of this. Yeah. It's a take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. That's yes. the narcissist forever. You want to take it? Take it with your eyes open. 
build your defenses, enhance your positive interjects, put up a firewall, yeah. and survive next to the narcissist, benefiting from his good sides. Because, for example, some narcissists are intelligent and can teach you a few things. Some, some are fun. Some are fun. Some, you know. But don't tell yourself, I'm going to transform the narcissist with my love. I'm no. going to heal. I'm going to heal his inner child and his wounds. This is yeah. grandiose. This is grandiosity to think that you could have any impact on the narcissist where mm -hmm. tens of thousands of scholars and therapists have failed. Yeah. To think that you will be the one. This is grandiose. You can change it. Yeah. Um, so um, the last question, because I set my time and I can see I have 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, we can talk more on this subject. Maybe if you agree, maybe we could talk uh, another time. <laughs> Possibly, yes. Thank yeah. you. Um, so um, how do we prevent our children to become narcissists in the future? Yes, Lydia. Yes, me. Me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I had uh, my own uh, uh, problems I wanted mm -hmm. to resolve. I went into child psychology much deeper, and I there was a summit of resilience. How to what was important uh, not to to be more resilient, resilient to narcissists, <laughs> resilient to psychopaths, <laughs> resilient is simple to learn to learn. Uh, your children should be encouraged to learn at all times. Uh, their parents should be aware, should be aware what are their uh, expectations of the child and not to yeah. enforce them, impose them. Uh, in effect, you, uh, when I face parents, I tell them, look, uh, you are both narcissistic. I don't, yeah. we all are. But if I will know what is your narcissistic trait, I will tell you how not to express it to your child. So awareness of narcissism uh, by both parents, uh, defining the traits and influences uh, on their children. So they will protect the child of pain, of emotional pain, and uh, to let the child to you know, to encourage the child to experience more and more things by explaining at the same time what what is going on there. So mm -hmm. if uh, this is a cup, this is a cup made of this, to smallest detail, to just for the child to get first the orientation of the environment. So uh, to to recognize uh, objects, to recognize the, the environment so they can have uh, their self of uh, being capable of sustaining themselves to be more uh, to to be aware to just get um, to teach the child to self-care to be more uh, more aware of the environment what was boundary so just a second this is between this is the first uh, first stage between two, four, five years. The mm -hmm. boundaries, uh, uh, they will, what he mentioned, when the child after two years will start to to <clears throat> uh, be exposed to other, to their peers. They are going into the world. They will have to socialize. So the parents should enforce, the, mm -hmm. I mean, should make it, you know, uh, more pleasurable uh, social uh, gaining uh, to allow their friends with their children to to come to them. They will go to them, you know, uh, to meet, to have some uh, uh, times together, to be more happy, to make uh, why interesting things. Not as I witness and as I see, they take their mobiles. They put cartoons, now you see it. No, the children should be engaged in the conversation. Never mind if it is tough or not, if they will not understand, and if they will ask the parent to explain, yes, the parent to be to explain it, 
uh, not to spare the child, the child of being hurt, because yeah. uh, this is the way how the child will experience what is hurt, will learn what is hurt. Then the mother sh uh, should uh, tell the child, "This is how you will protect. Whenever you will see that someone, in, a child with a stone in 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 the hand, you don't stand. You just go. Uh, you 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 don't ask what is his attention." You, you will just put yourself out of the way of his way. You understand? These are these are the uh, things that the mother, mother, because she the child has most confidence in the mother. She know the child knows that the mother will never abandon her, him. Then uh, when uh, the child child uh, trusts the mother first. Uh, actually, um, trust anyone who cares, but the mother should also make that distinction. Uh, to make that uh, distinction. Uh, distinction, not to uh, to to uh, show the child that he cannot, uh, that she, he, the child will, uh, should not trust the uh, guy with the stone in the head. You understand? Yeah. To show the differences, mother's role, father's role, ah, to teach the child in the formative years, uh, to get a sense, to develop the senses from the environment. When the child will enter the second phase, when uh, will start to socialize, will be ready to enable, will be enabled to make the difference. What is good? What is right? Okay, so they will, the child will be more, uh, will uh, have more, uh, will okay. trust, confidence, mm -hmm. the self-esteem will be good enough. So, and also in this age, when they are socializing, uh, it's very narcissistic uh, trait, but if they are not uh, narcissists, they will not <laughs> uh, see what they are made of, uh, mm -hmm. that they are very competitive. So mm -hmm. uh, the mother should regulate, the parents should regulate the competitiveness. Uh, competitiveness. That doesn't mean if uh, the guy has a, has a, some toy that they should buy to their children. They should say, but he likes it. Why would you like to have that? So uh, there are ways of uh, doing that, but uh, uh, for, uh, for a child, not to become narcissist later is to teach him how to care of uh, himself herself with the uh, with the emotionally uh, uh, to enable him enable the child to connect with others because narcissists don't connect with anyone because that is also part of the environment not only the objects but also the people so and how to be fair in in effect yes do uh, uh, the child should be provoked? They see uh, uh, when uh, with uh, in social milieu they there are fights and so on. Yes, you should fight for yourself. I will teach you how to fight. You know, it's not like okay, you should not fight. The uh, parents should uh, teach the child how to preserve what they think of them. That was validated by the parents and the others until then so it's, it's and it's ever parenting, changing parenting is complicated though by mm -hmm. by social media the online environment mm -hmm. social media were constructed around narcissistic uh, traits so social mm -hmm. media encourage shame by comparing yourself to others yes. social media encourage envy of course with likes and so on and so forth social media encourage grandiosity so there is a problem with exposure to the online world, which mm -hmm. complicates parenting, even good parenting, makes it almost, I would say, impossible. Suicides among, uh, among young people have increased by 48% in the last decade. Wow. 48%. These are the children of the trans transitional generation. This number is nothing compared to the following numbers. Depression is increased by 300%. Anxiety is increased by 
among young people. What's happening to the world? <laughs> I think um, we have relegated the role of parenting to technology companies. Mm. Started yeah. with television, long before internet. Long before internet, mothers used to put children in front of television. That's true. The TV uh, raises the children. Yes. <laughs> now the computer raises the children. Yes. Well, okay, so we have only two minutes because I set the timing. I think it, it ends, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of. So, so thank you so much. I I also have a lot of new information just talking to you aside from the books, and I really would like to talk to both of you again. And let me know if you have time. Um, yeah. You can also yeah. arrange. You can also arrange if you wish. You can arrange a public podcast. So you yes. can invite. You can invite people to a to a place, and it can be projected on a screen. Yeah, and I could give a lecture, for example, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, why not? Yeah, questions. and they could ask questions. The audience can ask questions. So it's done in many countries. You can mm -hmm. just put many people in a hall, a lecture hall, and a screen, and project the image on the screen. So today, yes. technology helps us to connect. Yeah. Yes, that's the advantage. We are here. <laughs> yes. And thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy it's going to end. And then let's talk again. And the opening of the book is on 13th, next Wednesday. And Wonderful. I'll send you this, uh, next week. Oh, I'll okay. go to the <laughs> thank, okay. thank, thank you, you very much. much. We're very excited. Thank, thank you. you very yes. much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a nice day there. Bye, Bye for okay. now. Bye for now. Thank you.